how are you planning to protect your infrastructure from being overwhelmed by an increase of load? Or what happens if there's a temporary blip which impacts the stability of your application? Are you building a multi-tenanted service and you need to protect some tenants from some kind of noisy neighbour? Then tune into this episode where I'm joined by John Downs once again and we talk through three different patterns today. The throttling pattern, the retry pattern and the circuit break pattern. Listen in to find out more. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Cloud with Chris. You're with me, Chris Reddington, and we'll be talking about all things cloud. So as we mentioned in the intro there, we will be continuing the discussion of architecting for the cloud one pattern at a time, which is coming along very nicely. And uh, we're once again joined by my colleague, John Downs, who I'm very pleased to have back with me because uh, we had a great discussion previously on the deployment stamps pattern. So without further ado, we'll uh, just go ahead and jump straight in uh, and not waste any time. So all there is to say is uh, good morning or good evening, John. How are you doing, sir? Good morning, Chris. I'm well, thank you. How are you? Yes, all good. Thank you. All good. And uh, once again, recording at fun hours of the day for both of us, but it's okay. It's uh, part of the fun. (laughs) Exactly. The the good thing about being on on a planet that's a globe. Indeed, indeed. Getting to the deep topics really quickly there. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, we've got a few different topics that we're going to cover today because uh, we've got a few different ideas relating to uh, potentially multi-tenancy and noisy neighbours and protecting those kinds of organisations, thinking about stability and just... I would consider them some of the basics of the cloud design patterns as well, to be honest. These are kind of the staples of if you're building a brand new application to the cloud, you want to go and make sure that you've uh, got things in order. So um, I'll let you reveal maybe what some of those are, but uh, that's at least my perspective on uh, on these ones we're talking about today. Yeah, absolutely, Chris. I, I agree with you. I mean, th- for the for me, especially the the, the, the second, uh, second and third of these patterns, uh, they're almost not really architectural patterns, they're just kind of good coding practice patterns that I think make sense everywhere. The cloud kind of uniquely requires them, but um, uh, but they, they certainly are, are useful everywhere. And they're a bit different to, I guess, some of the other patterns that, that you've talked about and that we talked about previously that are kind of more yeah. conceptual, more about how the entire solution works. These are quite focused on, on coding and, and kind of how mm. services work. Yeah, absolutely. Very tangible, aren't they? So I guess we've uh, teased it up uh, long enough. We should probably actually get into some of the topics here. So I'll bring up your screen here so everyone can see uh, the first one that we're going to be talking about, which is the throttling pattern. And I guess people normally talk about, you know, uh, I've been throttled or this, that or the other. So they may have an idea of what it means, but we should probably just level set uh, just in case uh, there are folks who don't really understand the term throttling there as well. Yeah, because throttling has kind of a a negative sound to it, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. So um, the throttling pattern is really there to help protect a service um, from high load or from from load that's that's kind of not expected or or that's not uh, not welcome, I guess. So um, a really good example of this is API rate limits. Um, If you are hosting an API... And you, uh, you you allow your clients to connect to that API and, and make requests. Um, then you want to make sure that that your application isn't going to be overwhelmed by lots and lots of requests, either from the same from the same customer or the same user or the same IP address, or even just broadly over the entire uh, over everybody who's accessing it. So, um, throttling is really there to protect your services and any downstream services or, or components that you might have. So things like databases uh, or you know backend service that you talk to, um, or potentially third party services as well. So throttling is really from from the it, it's something that we think about from the perspective of um, a service, right? It's it's a, a thing that the service does as part of its behaviour. Absolutely, um, and I know that. Um the third pattern we'll talk about as well, the circuit breaker pattern, uh, relates to this one very closely as well. So uh, I won't give the game away just yet. We'll come back to that <laughs> later. But uh, if people are thinking it's just an on-off switch and it's kind of binary, one or the other, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that either. And this is the magic of bringing multiple patterns together to uh, start building some advanced scenarios, isn't it? Mm, 
Yeah, yeah. And I think you made a really good point there, Chris, which is that I think when we when we think about throttling, then one of the things that uh, that we generally think about, and, and, and often many systems are designed this way, is uh, this kind of a, a binary gate almost, right? So you're basically saying yeah. this request is allowed and this request is allowed and no, nope, we put the wall up, but now this request isn't allowed here anymore. Um, and yeah. and there's, I mean, that's, that is a very common approach uh, and it's one that works really well for many systems. Um, but that's, that's only one way that you can use the throttling pattern um, sure. so that approach you know it's 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 many many Azure services for example uh, use that that kind of approach um, so if you for example use cosmos DB um, or mm-hmm. uh, service bus or some of those services that are uh, multi-tenant services where you provision a certain amount of capacity that, that you want to be able to use if you try and go over that capacity then then we'll basically just you know shut down the the, the, the service from you for a period of time. Um, but one of the, the interesting things about that is that in some of those services, uh, if you actually pay attention to how the, the, the service is communicating that message back to you, um, in the case of HTTP uh, responses, for example, um, we'll often send that response as an HTTP 429 which basically just means you're going too fast, slow down. Um, But in the case of something like Cosmos DB, there's actually a response header that we include in that response to say, uh, this is what we call the retry after header. So in other words, here's how long you should wait before you try uh, try making this request again. Uh, We'll talk about retries in a bit more detail (laughs) shortly, but it's interesting to know that there's, you could, the server can kind of give some hints back to the client about, um, about when they expect uh, that they're going to be back to be able to serve the request again. Absolutely. And and I think that's the nice thing. And the reason why we've kind of coupled these three patterns together, right, is because you can see that one really closely relates to the other, closely relates to the other again there. So, uh, mm. good, good. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think the, the uh, like I said, the, the returning a 429 or, a, you know, blocking a request is is one approach to, to dealing with throttling. Um, but I think the the design pattern that I've got on, on screen at the moment actually does a good job of talking about some of the other approaches that you could possibly use um, to try and, again, protect the backend systems that you're dealing with or to uh, to reduce the load um, while not necessarily just cutting everybody off, right? Um, so one yeah. approach, for example, that's talked about a little bit in here is um, that you could potentially have uh, have the ability to detect when you're going, on, going over some sort of limit and then you potentially turn off aspects of your system. So you turn off particular features. Um, mm. A really interesting example of this, uh, which is on a kind of a, a longer time scale, but uh, is uh, during the, the early days of the COVID pandemic. Um, mm. Microsoft Teams actually shut down some of the features in Microsoft Teams because it was being so heavily used. Um, and to be able to, to use that capacity for you know the core services in Teams, uh, they shut down some of the components, so things like uh, read receipts for messages. Mm. Um, they just said, we're just going to turn off that entire service, that entire feature. Um, so again, that's it's interesting to think about the fact that you might have these kind of knobs you can turn to, to be able to enable or disable uh, particular features that might not be as critical um, and your load recovers or, or the, the, the rates uh, requests go down, you can turn the back up again uh, dynamically. And that's a really brilliant point because I think a lot of the time when we talk requirements, we get a lot of people thinking the big picture that, hey, my system needs to be online or serving users or whatever the requirement may be for uh, this volume, for this amount of time, etc. But quite often I don't see people really think about what the core aspects are of the system so you know if if something bad happens and you know we get a surge in in requests for whatever reason then actually we can shut off and I guess we're almost getting a little bit into a bulkhead pattern there as well and being able Mm. to segment some of our different uh, aspects of the solution but being able to say right we need components uh, one component five, component seven. The rest we can just turn off. Uh, is a really good way of looking at it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And it's yeah. And it's it's it's. I, I was waiting to see how long it took for us to use the R word requirements um, in this conversation because I know <laughs> you and I are both a big fan of of, of trying to figure through that. Um, Two minus think, nine but, minutes, roughly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't take long at all. Um, but the uh, another aspect of that as well is that. 
Um, uh, this is a little bit off topic, but, but when I talk to customers about things like disaster recovery and building resilience, mm. um, that kind of idea of, of having some parts of your system that are absolutely critical and have to be working all the time or to a very high level versus the parts that don't. Um, it's useful to distinguish those. And um, in the documentation, we we call we talk about RTO and RPO, recovery time yes. objective, recovery point objective. Um, there's also the, another one in the recovery level objective, RLO, which I think doesn't get enough attention. So that's that same kind of idea. Uh, but of course, throttling is, is kind of talking about that on a on a slightly different level, um, just talking about how, uh, you know, how load can affect uh, the, the ability for features to run. Mm. And then the, the other aspect, another another way that you can um, think about uh, doing throttling is to reprioritize requests. So if you've got all of your requests coming in, um, then potentially you, you don't necessarily want to cut off customers when they get to a certain point. But what you might do, for example, is send their requests to a lower priority queue. All right. So uh, if there's nobody else using the system, then they'll still get processed as normal. Uh, if there is somebody else using the system, then they'd get bumped to the bottom of the list until their their um, uh, until their, their their rate limit is reset or or the, the situation is resolved. Um, gotcha. And that's kind of a, a, a specific example of a, a a kind of an idea of these soft versus hard limits, where you might have you know some some uh, some aspect of your system has been guaranteed up to some soft limit. So you know we'll we'll allow you to make API requests up to 10 per second. Uh, and then if you go above that, we'll do our best, but we don't make any guarantees. Um, yeah. That kind of idea is also a really interesting one to think about when you're, when you're designing, especially multi-tenant services and, and when you've got these shared resources that you need to be able to manage. Absolutely. And coming back to the point you mentioned earlier about things like Service Bus and Cosmos DB, um, that's pretty much how they work, right? Because they are multi-tenant mm. in nature, as you mentioned. And uh, you need to make sure that one noisy neighbor isn't impacting everyone else. And I think that was one of the things we said in the intro there is that uh, patterns like this really help protect different tenants if you're building that software as a service and have multi-tenanted uh, environments there. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, another really good example of that is uh, SQL Elastic Pools uh, in Azure. Mm, so yes. with that kind of that kind of design, um, again, you can you can put limits across individual tenants, across individual databases, uh, but then potentially allow them to kind of burst above those a little bit as well. And uh, again, if you've got the capacity sitting there, then you want to use it. Uh, but you also want to make sure that if you are under load, then you're, you're keeping control of that. So that's another really nice example of, of using that the same kind of idea of throttling but but not just you know shutting down all requests gotcha. um gotcha. and then there's another angle to this as well which i think that the this the design pattern does a really good job of of mentioning which is um illustrated in this diagram here which isn't the clearest diagram um but the the basic idea is that um if you detect a throttling situation, then you can also think about this in terms of kind of short-term and long-term uh, actions as well. So in the short term, you might just basically say, uh, we're going to start shutting down requests or we're going to you know, shut down features, uh, whatever, all the things we've talked about so far. But what you can also then do is use that as a signal to your, uh, to your system to say, well, we're currently under a lot of load. Maybe we need to scale. Right, and it'll probably take a little bit of time for that scale to be or that capacity to become available. Uh, so you'll mm. keep throttling until that capacity is available. Uh, but once you do, then you can then you can kind of take the brakes off again and and see how things go. So uh, that's, that's another really interesting um, uh, aspect of the throttling pattern as well is that it's not just there to protect you; it's also giving you a bit of a signal as well. Yeah, it's 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 almost acting as a bit of a buffer there, isn't it? In terms of right, we can see the early indications that um, we need to prepare the system for something that's coming in. Let's go mm -hmm. ahead, just temporarily leave ourselves from actually having to take all of that on uh, rate limits. And then once we've got the system to a state where we think we can handle it, off we go. Here we go again. We're back to normal. Uh, yeah. And it's quite absolutely. a nice dynamic way, isn't it? Rather than, like we said earlier, that binary on off, it's then adjusting, as you say, to some of those signals coming in. Nice. I like that. Yeah. 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 But I think that the key point there then is that you need to really design that up front, right? This isn't something that you can just absolutely. throw in at the last minute um so again requirements come into play here but but <laughs> having the idea that that you you want to architect for these kinds of uh that, that if you're going to be especially if you're going to be doing any kind of clever throttling around you know turning off 
features dynamically or reprioritizing requests or applying soft and hard limits or you know using it as an auto scale signal all of that requires that you really think through how you're going to achieve that and make sure you're architecting for that from the start um, if you're just doing rate limiting then that's that can be a bit easier to kind of bolt on but uh, that's also kind of the most blunt instrument you've got available to you for this pattern gotcha makes complete sense Makes complete sense. So I guess then where are the times where, uh, I think we're about to go to it on the screen there and thinking about some <laughs> of the challenges maybe and some of the times where it does make sense and doesn't make sense. I guess we've hinted towards some of them, for example, with, um, you know, multi-tenant scenarios where it certainly makes sense, but are there times where maybe it doesn't make so much sense and there may be some issues in us going down that path? Yeah, I think there's 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 a few that come to mind. So one in particular is this point here, which is um, you might need to consider if you are, especially if you're going to, you're, you find yourself throttling a lot and potentially unexpectedly throttling a lot, maybe that's an indication that you, you actually need to scale your system uh, and you need to increase the overall capacity. Um, so gotcha. again, thinking of throttling as a signal as much as it is a, uh, you know, an action that you can take um, helps to really understand, you know, if you're throttling every single request, because you're just constantly trying to keep up with demand, then maybe you need to be increasing the overall capacity and, and throttling is probably a bit overkill for that scenario. Gotcha. Um, and I think we, we, we also, when we when we start talking about the uh, the next two patterns, retry and, and circuit breaker, which are kind of on the, the client side of this um, equation, um, mm-hmm. it's also clear that, that you, when you start thinking, when you start thinking about those patterns, um, the, the way that the service can send signal back some of the information about what's actually happening is really important to the client as well. Um, so again, you want to be very clear about when and why you're throttling, and you want to make sure that you're sending the appropriate response to the client. So that they can understand what's happening and they can actually deal with that in a sensible way absolutely and yeah i I like the idea that you mentioned in the beginning there that if we've got a sustained amount of load which is coming in and it's just now the norm and the default uh, i think of this throttling approach as a bit like you know when you play the game monopoly and you've got your get out of jail free card it's a little bit like that isn't it Um, Mm. but if you've got that sustained period of load coming in or sustained way of working that you find the throttling the system is happening on a regular basis that's a good indicator that actually you need to look at something else there yeah, and equally, if you're on the client side, and we'll, we'll talk about this a bit more in a second, but if you're on the client side and you're seeing that all of your requests are getting throttled or a very large proportion of them are getting throttled, uh, maybe then you also need to look at you know increasing the the tier of the service you're talking to or provisioning more capacity in the service or whatever the case may be. Um, so that's yeah. an important uh, kind of corollary to, the, corollary to that as well. Um, and I think the other the other point I just want to re-emphasize here is that you know throttling, especially when we, we talk about those more complex aspects of throttling, really does need to be designed in. Um, having said that, if you're just looking at doing rate limiting and nothing else, um, you might be able to get by with something like you know, Azure API management or front door, uh, both of which have the ability to do some level of rate limiting. Um, mm-hmm. But again, those are going to be fairly blunt in what they do. They're just going to send back a 429 to the client and you know they'll reset counters and that kind of thing for you. Uh, so it's really useful and it's a really good backstop. And I would generally say if you are building any kind of especially public facing application, you should have some rate limit in there, even if it's high, um, just as a matter of course. Um, but, uh, but yeah, if you want to do anything more sophisticated, then you really need to plan for that up front. Gotcha. Makes sense. Okay. Cool. So, so that's the throttling side of things, and I think that's you know that's really from the point of view of the the service, right? So, if you're a service mm. designer, if, if you're, you're building an API or any other kind of service, multi-tenant or otherwise, uh, throttling is, is is something that you really want to consider. But of course, if you're on the client side of this equation then you've got to figure out what to do if you get throttled, right? And um, in, in applications that or a lot of customers that I work with who have applications that weren't originally designed for the cloud, um, yes. this is particularly a an interesting point because uh, a lot of the time if, if applications have been designed to run in a in a you know an on-premises environment or in a server room in a, in a server closet or something um, the, the number of things that can go wrong in terms of the connection from you know from server a to server B when they're literally connected by a, a one meter long Ethernet cable uh, is a lot smaller 
than when you deal with the the very complex multi-tenant environment of the cloud where you might have servers distributed across multiple buildings, multiple data centers, availability zones, regions with all sorts of networking and stuff in between. So the, the scope of things that can go wrong in the cloud is also much higher. And one of the things that I often see with customers who who bring their applications into Azure who haven't, um, haven't really thought this through ahead of time is that they will potentially start seeing some problems where, for example, they're trying to connect from their application to their database and it'll work 99.9% .9 of the time. And then 0.1% of the time, something will just not quite work right. And if they haven't designed for that upfront using these patterns we're about to talk about, uh, then potentially they're, they're going to have a bad experience. Um, and similarly, if, they, if they're if they using multi-tenant services like we've been talking about, um, if those limit them in any way, then, then they similarly are going to have uh, an application problem if they don't design for that up front. So yeah, the absolutely. next two patterns we'll talk about, the retry and circuit breaker are really there to help the client to make sure they're being sensible about how they deal with those situations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I can only echo everything you've said there, John, in terms of the number of customers and clients that we work with that come in and have that application. They think they can just go, okay, there we go. But it's done. It's in the cloud. Uh, you know, I think there was one slight thing that you didn't say in there, which is this big uh, network called the internet as well that we happen to have mm. to use with the cloud, which is extremely yeah. unreliable. And, uh, you know, yes. routes might get changed, routes might get blocked, um, something might appear like it's not there for a certain time, and then the next millisecond it's actually back. Uh, we call those transient failures for anyone who's mm. listening in. And uh, I think this is exactly where the retry pattern can help, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, yeah, very much as as we said earlier, one of those foundational patterns to when you're building a, uh, a cloud architecture and a cloud application here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's, yeah, it's, it's probably worth just kind of delving into that idea of transient failures, transient faults, because um, that is such an important aspect of, of designing for the cloud. Um, and it's, I think, one of the principles that that I think is, is a really important design principle in the cloud is to not try and paper over those kind of scenarios and, and those, those situations and pretend they don't exist and kind of, you know, ignore them. The way that we actually achieve higher resiliency in the cloud is to acknowledge that that happens and then to build in the resiliency necessary in our solutions uh, so that if it does happen, then we can figure out what to do about it. And so that's where these kind of patterns come in to really make uh, to make that possible. Um, because it's not just about, you know, you, you talked about the Internet and all of the, the myriad things that can go wrong on the Internet. But also, I mean, obviously, we've talked about throttling, right? That's a, that's another yep. at another time when you could potentially have a, a request that's that's failed for some reason. Um, but also, there's you know there are there are plenty of situations where independent of the network failing, um, a particular service uh, that you're talking to or a particular um, you know, uh, product in Azure, for example, uh, might just stop responding for a period of time. Um, so I've actually pulled up the, just as an example, I've pulled up the, the service level agreement for Azure SQL Database, which is a, sure. a service that lots of our customers use. And it's a it's long and I'm not going to read it all, but, but the important thing I wanted to, to kind of um, point out in here is if you look down at the definition of what downtime means, for Azure SQL Database. What it says is, a minute is considered unavailable for a given database if all continuous attempts by customer to establish a connection to the database within the minute fail. So what that means is that if you have a, a, a failure, of, if the database is, is unavailable or you can't connect to it for 58 seconds, that's actually not considered to be downtime, right? And so this is this is a normal failure mode of, of Azure SQL DB. And so when you're architecting systems for the cloud, you really need to understand these kinds of failure modes and to understand what kinds of things could actually happen uh, and what points they're considered to be normal and abnormal. Um, so if we look at SQL Database, then you know if, if you have a situation where you, you get a failed request from your application, um, then retrying that request, for example, of, up for a period of up to a minute uh, is, is likely to succeed, is what the, basically the, the SQL team is telling us here. So that's uh, that's a really important point to consider is um, that, yeah, the, not only is it is it going to be all these kinds of random things that happen, but but also this is actually something that's just part of the, the, the way that the cloud works. Absolutely. And also the, the subtle point in there as well, that if I am adopting the retry pattern and my first five attempts, because, you know, maybe I'm doing some kind of exponential back off and uh, I can fit within 30 seconds those retries of the five of them. Um, if 
those fail, but then suddenly I get one that works and then uh, another that doesn't, then that resets the timer as well. It's thinking about those yeah. kind of scenarios about we yeah. might even get into the world of caching then at that point, because if mm. that particular component fails, you've at least got to cache somewhere else. And you, I think your point is completely valid, going back to the failure mode analysis effectively, mm. that mm. if that thing fails, what is then the, I like to call it the blast radius, what what do we then need to think about as a result of that? So yeah, really like yeah. that point. Yeah, yeah. And you int- you introduced a really interesting um, point there, which was around exponential backoffs as well. So I want to I really want to delve into that a bit too, because um, there's there's I guess there's in my mind there's there's a few different ways that you can retry requests, and the retry pattern kind of captures all of this. So one is that you immediately retry, right? If you have a failure talking to a system, you don't wait; you just immediately retry. Depending on the reason that that failed, um, that that may or may not be very likely to succeed, right? So, um, in many cases, an, an immediate retry, you know, within a few milliseconds, uh, probably the conditions that 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 led to that original request failing may not have been resolved yet. So that may or may not succeed. Um, but then there's another uh, another thing you can do, which is to wait. Right, and this is where things get a bit more interesting with the retry pattern because um, you can kind of just just wait, you know, a, a one second, two seconds, five seconds, just kind of a constant period of time, and, and maybe allow for five retries with five seconds apart. And if it if it fails after that, then fine, that's that's just too bad. We'll we'll throw an exception and and figure it out later. Um, but you but you talked about exponential back off, which is another interesting strategy, which is where you you wait increasingly long periods of time between requests, right? So you give the service more of a chance to recover um, as you go through each of those um, each of those iterations of the loop, essentially. Um, but then there's another another thing that you really need to consider here as well, which is that at some point you need to give up, right? You will. There, we do need to allow for the fact that we're not just going to retry forever. At some point in time, we need to basically say, no, this that's game over for this particular transaction or request. Uh, we we need to to just give up. And again, if we think back to our favorite topic requirements. Um, this is this is a really important point because um, if we if we're just looking at a, a given little piece of code in isolation, we might just say, well, we're just going to keep retrying forever. If you look at this from an architectural point of view, then maybe it's actually better to give up sooner and to let the components higher up in your stack or you know other other parts of your infrastructure or your client uh, give them the opportunity to recover in some other way. Um, so giving up and and kind of just throwing throwing the the rec- the, the problem back to the client um, isn't necessarily a problem. It's just something that you need to to be very conscious about. You know how for how long will you retry? What makes sense? And at what point should you give up? And the answer to that might be very different parts of your solution. Absolutely, and uh, I, I might slightly give the game away here, but I know we'll talk about that in the next pattern then as well because uh, that really does, I guess, uh, influence how we handle what we do from the client side of things. You know, if we, if we can yeah. see that actually. It, it's looking like it's just going to keep failing, keep failing. There's no point overwhelming the system because that's just going to exacerbate even further potentially the problem that is happening with the service. But uh, we'll, we'll park that one for now because we will come back mm. to a circuit breaker, which is kind of what I'm explaining there. So uh, yeah, let's go yeah. with retry for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a really good point, though. I will come back to that, definitely. Um, and I think the, the other thing to bear in mind, too, is that, like I said before, in the throttling pattern, um, if a service actually is, is clever enough to be able to tell you when its rate limit is going to be reset, um, then that gives you a, a really nice thing to be able to plug into your retry logic, right? So if you if you make a request, the service says, I'm too busy to accept this request, uh, but come back in 300 milliseconds, then you can wait 300 milliseconds, try again, and then hopefully you've you've kind of reduced the number of retries that you're you're you know attempting. You've reduced the amount of time that you need to waste waiting for that. Um, and and hopefully your next request will succeed. Um, there are many ways that can go wrong. <laughs> so if you think about a database like Cosmos DB, which is a good one that does this, um, that's you know the, the, it's going to be giving you back an answer based on what it knows at the point in time when it calculated how long it thinks you need to wait. But if at that 300 millisecond mark suddenly there were a whole bunch of other requests that came. In, you might you might accidentally end up in the back of the queue, right? So um, you you can't guarantee that that is absolutely going to be uh, a, a, you know a, a, a definite uh, a successful transaction at that point, uh, but at least it gives some indication that that's you know that's the minimum amount of time that you'll need to wait at least.
Absolutely. And it's interesting you mentioned that because I was just thinking the same myself and that actually when we're talking about clients, we don't necessarily mean, you know, a, a client on my desktop or a web client at all. It could be, for mm. example, um, a pattern we'll be talking about uh, in a couple of weeks with Will is mm. um, the queue-based load leveling pattern and competing consumers. And those mm. competing consumers, when they're taking things from the queue, are effectively a client potentially to like a database like you were just saying with Cosmos. So we should yep. probably call that out that client doesn't necessarily mean the stereotypical yep. client that people mean as yeah, well. Yeah, browser or something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. No, Indeed. it can be anybody that's that's making a, an outbound request really. Um, that's yeah. that's kind of the, yeah. And uh, many applications will both be clients and servers uh, and we'll have to kind yeah. of think about all of these patterns together, right? Um, Indeed. Yeah. And I think there's another aspect to that as well, which is that, the the retry pattern. Um, so we've talked about you know throttling. We've talked about transient failures, but that there's also a, a, another type of failure that we need to allow for, which is kind of permanent failures. Right? These are these are failures either because you know the the service is just completely dead, uh, which does happen, but it's not too no comp, too common. Or more likely, um, the request that we're making to the server is never going to succeed. Right? So mm-hmm. uh, if you think about HTTP and HTTP status codes. Um, if I make a request to a server, like a you know a post request, and I get back a 400 bad request, uh, what that that means, uh, and according to the HTTP specification, is that if I was to retry that request, no matter how many times I retry it, the server is not going to accept it because something about the the way I've formatted that request or the the input I provided, whatever it is, is invalid. And so it's, there's actually no fault on the server; it's it's behaving as it should. It's just that it's giving me an answer that I didn't necessarily want. Right, um, there's something wrong yeah. with my code, or you know, the way that I'm I'm working with the service. Um, so we need to be really careful to distinguish um, those kind of permanent failures from the more transient failures, like you know, like the networking issues, like services being down, like throttling. Um, so and those those second category are worth retrying, and and you know they they again depending on your requirements, depending on on what you need to do. Uh, but for permanent failures, you want to make sure that you're not retrying those unnecessarily because all you're going to do is is you know waste your time and waste the server's time. You're better off failing fast, logging that, making sure that that's really clearly uh, explained in your logs, for example, uh, or escalating to a human or whatever the case may be, uh, and then just considering that to be that that's that's not going to be successful. Yeah, and and once again potentially exacerbating uh, a problem there as well because uh, that's obviously going to take some cycles from the server that you're or service you're trying to deploy to uh, or to deploy to send to, um, mm. and this is the challenge as well as if you are having high loads and it's this particular issue that's uh, you know not necessarily driving that problem but it could be somehow contributing to the problem as well so uh, yeah good call mm. there. Yeah, yeah. And actually, I just want to pick up on that point, um, Chris, because that's an interesting one around kind of exacerbating problems for a server. So let's say that you've you've got an application that, uh, you know, is talking to a server, this uh, Mm. an API or something, Um, that API has a problem. Um, let's say it's you know it's overwhelmed with requests, um, and if our clients are uh, just basically just retrying immediately, like they're just kind of going into a, a tight loop, retrying, 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 and we have lots of those clients all doing that, um, then potentially the service is going to have a really hard time recovering, because as soon as it makes any headway into trying to to get on top of its load, it's suddenly inundated with a bunch of requests from us, right? And um, and we call this a retry storm. Um, so the again, if you've got one of those kind of retry after response headers and the and the requests and the response that 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 tells you to come back later, then obeying that will help to that help to do that. But also, you know, exponential backoffs and you know uh, having a, a a point at which you say we're not going to keep retrying. Those kinds of things are, are really important. As is not using too low an interval between these retries. So you need to have a little bit of empathy for the for the service you're talking to as well, and not just assume that I am the most important service that can possibly be talking to you, and you need to I'm just going to keep bothering you like a toddler until you finally answer me. Um, you know, we need to, to allow us some time and, and space to be able to, to to recover and come back to back to life again. Yeah, absolutely. 
I think we're uh, and in that, encroaching closer and closer to that next pattern, aren't we? I think we are. Yeah, I was just about to say, yeah. So that, that kind of leads to this, <laughs> this idea of the circuit breaker pattern. So I kind of think of this as like an extension of the retry pattern, right? It's a, it's a, it's a fancy retry uh, pattern, essentially. Um, so in the retry pattern, we it's kind of a, a stateless pattern, right? We're well, mostly stateless. So we're, we're basically just saying, I want to, to try the request. And then if it fails, I'll wait some period of time and then try again. And, you know, keep doing that for some number of times and then maybe give up. In the circuit breaker pattern, what we're doing instead is um, we're basically setting this thing called a circuit breaker, which is which maintains some state, right? Um, so if oh, actually there's a good diagram here, I'll, I'll show you how that works. Um, so if the uh, if the um, if the client tries to, to access the, the the resource, like a database or, or an API of some kind, um, the circuit can be in what we call the closed state. Um, so this basically, sorry, open state. I'm getting myself confused. So the service can be in the open state. Um, so the open state basically means that the the request will will succeed. It will it will make its way through um, as expected. Um, and if everything is is happy and healthy, then the circuit breaker essentially just allows the request all the way through. The response comes back. Everything is good. Um, but if there's some sort of problem in the service, like all the ones we've talked about before, um, then the circuit breaker will basically uh, shut itself off. Right? It will basically say, what we're going to do is all of the requests that are coming through at the moment are going to just immediately fail. So this is a client-side object of some kind that essentially intercepts the request on its way out and just comes back and says, look, at the moment, the service you're trying to talk to is not accepting requests. Uh, go away. You know, maybe queue up this request for later. Maybe do something to, to kind of uh, to, to, to internally retry uh, until you get to a point where, uh, where I'm telling you it's okay. And then at a certain point, uh, the circuit breaker will then decide, okay, it's been long enough. I'm going to test the waters and see if the service is back online. So what it might do then is going to a half open state where it basically says, uh, I'm going to just try letting some requests through, uh, maybe one, maybe a few. Uh, and if that request succeeds, probably the service is healthy again. And then I'll, I'll eventually let everything through. But if that request fails, then I'll just say, okay, I'm giving up again. I'm going to going to wait some time. Um, so from the from the point of view of, of the, the client, um, the circuit breaker becomes essentially a, almost like a proxy for the service. Um, and what it's really doing is adding a whole lot of intelligence uh, and state uh, to basically keep track of the state of that service and then to, to kind of avoid unnecessarily uh, putting load on the service if it can't cope with it. Gotcha. And you were completely right first time around, by the way, with the closed uh, closed state for it being healthy. I always get um, this wrong. I, <laughs> so, so do I. But the way uh, the way I always try to think about it for anyone listening in is a bit like um, uh, a circuit diagram and think about closed as allowing the kind of current through and open then not allowing it through. And that's the only way in my mind that I can get my mind around it because I'm like you I always go open means okay we're open, open. for business let's go right. ahead and yes. yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly yeah, yeah. but it's kind of the yeah. opposite way around which is uh, always gets me um, but I guess I mentioned the circuit diagram example um, mm. the other example that is very relevant in these times if you look across the world with everything going on with COVID is people tr or governments trying to control the spread of COVID and uh, the infection rates so they are effectively using this kind of circuit breaker pattern um, if you look at Wales where where I'm from, um, they called it a fire break for some reason, but uh, effectively it's called a circuit break. And uh, they did the same thing. They could see cases rising and said, right, we're temporarily going to put restrictions in place, bring that down, control it, don't overwhelm the system. You know, similar analogies right here. And now we'll open things back up again and let things keep going. Um, so just in case anyone's trying to get some analogies to how this works you know, mm. circuit diagrams. And uh, uh, when you think of the circuit breaker in your plugs, that's exactly what we're talking about here. Same with uh, what governments are doing to control the spread of COVID as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yet I think, yeah, I always, with any of these design patterns, really, any of the ones we've, in the entire architecture center, I always try and imagine kind of real world analogies. And I think that's a really good one. Yeah. Um, you know, Q-based load leveling, I always think of the bank and, you know, those kinds yes. of things are, are really good analogies. So it's, it helps to, to kind of um, think through this. I'm not entirely sure how half open circuits work in the real world, but maybe in a way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I was trying to think of that one, but I gave up this. So. <laughs> if, if anyone, if anyone listening in has an analogy let us know because we would uh, we would love to hear that 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think the, the the one of the key things to understand about the the circuit breaker pattern is well, firstly, it's it requires state, right? So you do need to to kind of the circuit breaker needs to remember where you know whether the service is up or down, and and what the kind of time frame it should be looking at for retrying and for allowing you know requests to go through and that kind of thing. Um, so it is a more complex pattern to implement because of that reason. Having said that, there are some really good implementations available just kind of you know, out of the box from various solutions. So um, if we talk about just things like the Azure SDKs, uh, as far as I know, they don't use circuit breaker pattern, but they do implement retry logic for you. Um, but then if you're if you're in the .NET world, for example, then the Poly library um, is a really good uh, library to deal with things like circuit breakers and more complex retry logic and that kind of thing. Um, and then if you, there's also some interesting ways of doing kind of distributed um, circuit breakers for, for, you know, for more complex uh, kind of uh, higher order systems using things like uh, Azure durable functions and durable entities and and that kind of thing too. So um, you don't necessarily want to or, or should uh, be building the stuff yourself. Um, there's some of this logic is is available to you in, in those kind of forms as well. Absolutely. And there's an, even another interesting scenario as well, just given we're really in the depths of the application design world here. Um, if you're going down a route like uh, using Kubernetes as a platform and just caveat here mm -hmm. is that this is not the single reason to use Kubernetes, by the way. So don't think, right, I've got this scenario. I need to use it. We see a lot of yep, that. So yep. don't think yep, this. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. But for example, with Kubernetes, um, one of the common things that you can implement on a Kubernetes cluster is a service mesh. And this service mesh is... Uh, basically this kind of layer that you're putting to intercept any kind of networking call and you can do things like observability uh, you can understand uh, logging, logging and metrics and these kind of things um, but one of the common examples is you could implement some of these patterns in that particular layer so if you think about the distributed scenario like you were just saying with different microservices and we've got our python our dot nets our ruby different microservices because of course they don't all need to be the same uh, same language and same framework as a back-end developer we would potentially have to re-implement those patterns with every single um, different framework and that's going to be a lot of overhead on application development teams but with a service mesh you could implement it at that layer it's consistently applied then across all those microservices as well so again and not a reason to go down that path, but just another good example of what you were saying there, John, that you don't always have to necessarily implement this yourself. Yeah, I was actually just looking up to see whether Dapper also has a circuit breaker in it. Um, and that's apparently something on their roadmap. It's not there today. But Dapper, nice. is a, it's not a service mesh, but it's kind of gives you some of those same uh, qualities. Indeed. It kind of takes care of some of these these kinds of non-functional concerns or, you know, common concerns to a lot of a lot of applications and a lot of um, components. Uh, so, yeah, any of these kinds of things, these are these are solved problems, right? And you want to try and make use of, of the really good implementations, really well-tested implementations that are already out there. Uh, rather than building it yourself. Absolutely. Um, and then one other thing I just want to quickly throw in just before we finish up is um, mm. that with with retries and the circuit breaker really um, it's it's important to remember that as with as with throttling um, when you run into these situations where you're you're retrying requests or your you know the circuit is, is becoming open or half open um, that you are um, not just treating this as a, as a problem to solve in your code but you're treating that as some interesting information some signals that you that you can record so I I always suggest that if you if you're logging uh, if if you're retrying or if you're you're doing any kind of circuit breaker um, code that you make sure you log information about uh, the fact that you've uh, that you've retried how many attempts um, kind of if there's any more contextual information you can log to help understand when that happened because. When you start to analyze that in the aggregate, um, you might find, for example, that at certain times of the day, we're having to retry a lot more than others. Or when we're accessing this one system, we have to log a lot, we have to retry a lot more than others. Um, and again, if you're thinking about this from the point of view of managing capacity and making sure that you've you've provisioned uh, the right kind of, of capacity and tiers and everything for your services, um, you don't want to be throwing away important information. You want this telemetry to be captured so that you can uh, you can proactively respond to it. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the common questions we get, isn't it? When we go back to the R word requirements and we ask, you know, what is the level of load you're expecting on the system? Is there that seasonality? Mm. You kind of get this mm. look of 
rabbit in headlights like uh okay I don't you know i don't know when they are uh, i can roughly tell you but specifics i'm mm. not sure and mm. this is exactly as you say a really good way of just building upon that telemetry and understanding are there those seasonality pieces that uh, contribute to that problem yeah absolutely yeah yeah Good. cool yeah so i'm just trying to think of, i think we've, we've done a pretty good job of covering the the basics of all of yeah. those patterns i think um yeah. Yes, yeah, so I guess. I <laughs> indeed, I guess um, probably a point for us to start wrapping up here. Just looking at the time uh, <laughs> that we spent talking, and again, mm. another great session. Um, any last minute kind of remarks or things you just want to reiterate from uh, what we've been talking about there overall, there, John? Yeah, I think for me, the the these patterns that we've talked about, especially retry and circuit breaker, are important patterns for anybody who's developing against the cloud to understand. Um, I know that there are a lot of people who are who consider themselves to be developers and not architects, or you know, not not predominantly architects, and so they don't necessarily think about you know reading architecture design patterns and thinking through architecture problems and those kinds of things. Um, and that's that might be fair enough if that's kind of not your your area, then that's that's all well and good, but. These two patterns, and, and there are others as well, uh, are important patterns to, to understand. They, they they are impacted by being in the cloud, um, but they really do have an impact on the, the code that you write and the configuration that you apply to your code and that kind of thing. So um, I guess the, my, my point here is that these patterns are, are patterns for everybody uh, who's working with the cloud, not just for people who are designing systems and putting things on whiteboards. Excellent. Really great final point there, John. Thank you. Um, so another great session. Thanks again for joining, John. Really appreciate talking through these uh, these three patterns. And I think uh, certainly the folks listening will get a lot of value. So thank you again. Thanks, Chris. And until next time, I'm sure we'll uh, have some more to talk about. <laughs>